Good afternoon, folks. Uh, welcome to the Evident Inspection 360 webinar. Uh, I'm Michael Hall, one of the X-ray specialists uh, at what used to be Olympus, now Evident Scientific. And uh, we should have a good webinar for you today. We're gonna talk about things to know in geochemical XRF testing. When you're using XRF to do geochemistry, uh, what are best practices, what are pitfalls to avoid? So it should be a, a good session and I appreciate you all joining this afternoon. A couple things to know, um, we do have a uh, engagement platform. You can ask questions. I'll be trying to monitor the questions as we go through. Um, if, I, if I see those, I catch my eye, I'll try to answer uh, as you submit those, but we'll also have time for questions and answer at the, uh, at the end of the webinar as well. So um, if I missed a question along the way or something comes uh, to mind at the end, we'll have plenty of opportunity to answer questions. And so I hope we get lots of uh, engagement uh, from you there. As well, uh, within about 24 hours after the completion of this webinar, you should get a follow-up email with a link to the playback. So if you want to watch it again, see a section, share it with a colleague, um, uh, or if you missed us live and now are joining in the playback, um, you'll have that opportunity to, um, to see that. So let's jump in. Let's talk about some things to know in geochemical uh, testing. Okay, uh, we're gonna be using a concept um, throughout this talk that we call fit for purpose. Uh, it's, it's a way of asking the question of when is good, good enough, okay? And uh, there's a lot of places in this in life where you can describe things with an investment curve, where we consider how much time or effort or money we put into something, and then what, what kind of gain or return, ROI on our investment do we get? And ideally, right, you things would be one for one or one for two. The more efforts you put in or the more money you put in, the greater the return on your investment. But in reality, it's usually some kind of uh, sort of decreasing returns, the more effort up to some 100% level. So if we consider some of the, these uh, examples of this investment curve in life, well, we could talk about ramen noodles. And I, I don't mean the fancy ramen noodles that all the foodie people are eating today. I'm talking about the ramen noodle that got us all through college, right? Relatively low cost uh, on the x-axis. Uh, and we ate it because, although maybe it didn't taste that great, at least it gave us enough nutrition to, to get through, right? So cost benefit uh, analysis there. You compare that to something else from college like light beer, right? Obviously it has the advantage of being cheap questionable whether we get any return on our investment at all for something like that. You can compare that though to something like a space shuttle launch, right? Uh, which we know costs millions and millions of dollars, right? But in a situation where failure is not an option, where anything less than 100% uh, is not an option, right? Then the cost is really, really high and really goes up exponentially to reach that, that perfect level. So where you fall on an investment curve depends on what kind of things you're doing, whether you're having a beer with your friends or launching a space shuttle or doing so XRF measurements, you might fall on different places on this investment curve. Uh, and so I'm always looking for the shortest path between me and the solution, right? And so we have, we have our XRF instrument. We also sell an accessory called uh, the soil foot. Uh, turns the instrument into a tripod uh, type setup so you don't have to bend over while during the test is running, do soil analysis or that sort of thing. But when the uh, Vanta was first released, we didn't have the soil foot accessory. I had to do some testing for, um, for, our, for our client. And so you can see here my, uh, my paint sticks and a couple two by fours. I'm gonna get her done here with my uh, MacGyvered uh, soil foot. Now, uh, I was encouraged then actually that one of our customers in South America sent us a picture of, of their setup. They're a getter done person as well. A little bit of PVC and some Velcro and a hacksaw, and they've got themselves a makeshift soil foot as well. So I'm a getter done kind of guy, but what kind of uh, effort you need to put in for the return on your investment depends on where you are uh, at, what your requirements are versus the the input of energy. So you take something like limits of detection versus how long you want to test, or something like precision versus test time, again, uh, throughput question here, or, or accuracy versus how much sample prep, right? You may fall in different places on this curve depending upon what the requirements are on your project. And so it's not possible for me to say one right answer 
for, for how long you should test or how much sample prep you should do, but rather it depends on what the objectives are of your project. So in today's presentation, we'll talk about some of the considerations uh, that you should keep in mind as you decide where you want to fall on this uh, investment curve. And all of this collectively we refer to as being fit for purpose. What are your objectives? And based on your objectives, what, what fits in terms of testing protocol the best uh, alignment for your objectives for your project? Now, this is uh, this is actually some of my favorite material to present because it's it's very very practical information. Um, so I can geek out about spectra and X-ray physics, but the things we're going to talk about today are very very practical considerations that you can take with you as you design your uh, your testing program. And so uh, I could consider some other titles for this webinar, like how to not forfeit your field season, how not to spend all summer in the field collecting data, only not to have any data worthwhile, or how don't waste your x-rays, or garbage in, garbage out, right? How you test can impact the quality of your results. So although these are alternate titles, there is fundamentally only one reality, and that is that the factors that we're going to discuss today are a function of x-ray physics, of sample composition, and not of instrument manufacturer. So if you're joining our webinar today and you don't have uh, an Olympus XRF instrument, uh, if you have a, one from another manufacturer or you don't have one at all, that's fine. Welcome to our webinar today. But the information we're sharing is not uh, unique to evidence XRF instruments, but it's true for XRF measurements in general. So it should hopefully be valuable for you, um, even if you don't have one of our instruments. So let's jump in. One of the key principles uh, to keep in mind during all of uh, XRF measurements is, uh, is homogeneity or consistency. Okay, so I have here, you have to see the picture of the instrument. I have a little schematic here. Let's imagine uh, a hypothetical sample that's 50% iron and 50% zinc, right? 50% iron by weight, we call that the red here. 50% zinc by weight, call that the black, okay? If you had a sample that was 50-50, but all the zinc was on the bottom, x-rays go in and x-rays go out, you're gonna get um, a reading that is not representative of the 50-50 because the instrument's not measuring all the way through the sample. Okay, and even if you were to sort of layer this in, you can see here, right, you know, the x-rays are going through more black. Let me get my laser pointer on here. Going through more black layers than they are red layers. So again, we're gonna have an over-reporting of our black or our zinc, whatever this represents. I like to think of this as the, uh, the timpani principle of XRF. If you go to the orchestra, they always put the timpani in the back, right? Because if you put the drums in the front, you put the timpani in the front, you're never gonna hear the flute or the, or the, or the violin over top of, of the, the timpani. Or if you wanna reverse your analogy here, right? When I go to a concert, I actually like to sit in the back because the mosh pit down front is so loud, it's deafening, right? All right, proximity to the detector, the sample's proximity to the detector will determine uh, what kind of reading you get. An XRF is a near surface measurement, so it's essential that the surface of your sample be representative of the bulk overall if you want to get a representative reading. Again, feel free to put questions into the, the chat, uh, question chat section as we, as we go along. All right, so these issues of uh, being a near surface measurement are compounded by the fact that uh, in general, we have a pretty small sample size or, or spot size for the x-rays. Uh, typically about eight to 10 millimeters. Again, really doesn't matter which manufacturer you purchase from, they're typically in the range of eight to 10 millimeter spot size. So here's the uh, picture of the front of our analyzer here. This window here at the top is where the x-rays come out and come back. Okay, you can see here I can place a dime inside that window. So pretty small, typically about eight to 10 millimeters or um, spot size. So, it, it, you know, again, imagining a sample that is somehow stratified here, uh, you're gonna not report evenly. So again, the surface must be representative of the bulk. If you can homogenize your sample, that's the best case scenario. We'll talk about which, what to do if you can't homogenize your sample, okay? So let's look at an example here. Um, here's, a, here's a sample. This is a uh, fertilizer, just, you know, common household or garden fertilizer. But we can sort of think of this as like synthetic granite, right? Some, some type of rock 
uh, or mineral sample that has a large grain size. Since this is a um, household garden fertilizer, right? It's got some nitrogen, some urea. Uh, it's got some potassium in there. It's got some calcium and lime in there. And of course, it's got some iron in there to make my grass be nice and green. Okay, well, with an eight to 10 millimeter spot size, right? If I, depending on where I place it on the sample, in this case, you don't even have to be a geologist to know where the iron is. That's gonna be in those red clumps, nice iron oxide there, right? So if I place the sample uh, spots uh, on this part of the sample, I'm gonna get a lot of iron reporting. But if I move over just a few millimeters, you can see now I have no red spots within the beam uh, area, analysis area. And I'm gonna report significantly less uh, iron, okay? Here, when I took a test, I got about 0.35% iron was reported. But if I took that sample and I ground it up, uh, you can see it's not perfectly homogenous. You can still see some different, uh, you know, sort of color. There's a dark spot, dark spot, some lighter spots, but definitely pretty fine grain now. The instrument reported 0.94% iron by weight. And if you were to trust the uh, the back of the bag, right? They said 1% was was the iron. Maybe they were rounding right. But you can see this is a pretty good reading once I give the instrument a representative sample. Now, the question is, what do you do if you don't have the option to grind your sample? What if you're testing core or hand samples or you're doing field testing, right? Well, the biggest tool in your arsenal here to improve the accuracy of your readings is to do multiple tests and average those results. Take, test multiple spots on the core, two or three, four spots, depending on what your test times are, average those results to get a representative. And that will minimize the impact of the grain size here uh, in, your, in your sample. So particularly the case when you're doing core testing uh, or have hand samples or outcrops here, um, the best tool in your arsenal is to take multiple tests and average them. And we have the averaging feature and multiple tests feature built in automatically into our software. You can activate that um, quite easily. Now, as the grain size in your samples goes down, finer grains, some oftentimes sedimentary um, deposits, right, or soils where they're fine grain, then the impact from, from uh, is decreased because your sample becomes more homogenous as your grain size gets smaller. Here's some data um, from our friends at, at Reflex. And uh, this is kind of a, a busy slide, so I wanna talk you through it step-by-step, uh, uh, step. but I think it illustrates a good point here about uh, sample prep and, and grain size relative to the impact. So let's start up here in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, and we're looking here at, at, at copper readings and PPM. We have several different uh, sample types. So in the purple here is the rock, okay? Just hand samples or, or core. Uh, solid rock samples here. Um, we have in the green some finer chips if this has been uh, uh, ground up to approximately about one millimeter. Uh, the blue here represents pucks that have been pulverized and pressed. So this is sort of ideal conditions here. Uh, and, and sort of in between the fine chips and the puck, if we have some powders and we're testing through a sample bag or using some uh, you know food wrap or glad wrap or saran wrap um, to test those the, the, through those powders, okay? Now what you'll notice here for, for a heavy element like copper is that in general, the average reading marked in, marked in black here, the average reading actually doesn't vary that much for a heavy element for copper as we go to more and more sample prep. Okay? But what you will notice, so that's in terms of accuracy, but what you will notice is that the, the standard deviation uh, of the readings significantly improves. So here on the rock sample, we're going all the way from uh, less than 80 ppm to this outlier of almost 250 ppm as we tested various places on the rock sample. Pretty large standard deviation. When we, when we grind those chips to fine, our standard deviation goes down. When we test our sample bag or glad wrap, then we, we increase our standard deviation. I'll talk about sample containment later on in the talk. And then of course, best case when it's homogenized and pressed into a pellet, very tight precision and high accuracy on our reading. Now, if we compare that to a light element like magnesium, same sort of color scheme here, now you'll see that the average reading varies widely for a light element. I'll talk about this theme of light elements later on, uh, and the same variation. through And when we test through something like a sample bag or food wrap, 
we're torpedoing our light element reading relative to from what it what it should be. Okay, so if you're doing a, some type of a survey and you're looking for trends in your copper, maybe maybe hand samples, outcrops, direct soil tops is is fine enough for you with little sample prep. In fact, we have a great case study from Hanan Metals in Peru where they're looking at copper and soil samples with with minimal preparation. But if you need to get a highly precise reading on your your rock forming minerals like magnesium, then you're likely going to need to do more more prep. Okay. And thank you to, to Reflex for sharing this, this data with us. So the take home lesson here is that the amount of sample prep that's required is determined by what you need in terms of precision and accuracy for your project, okay? And in some projects, maybe you're doing quick and, quick and dirty, you're gonna get her done, your precision requirements are as high. If you're reporting values to investors uh, or, or a regulatory body, maybe you're doing uh, brownfield remediation and you need to know that the, the soil has been properly treated, you might need higher levels of precision and accuracy. But that's driven by the project and you can make those sample prep decisions based on the requirements of your project. Okay, so if we look at our investment curve again in terms of something like test time, versus precision. In general, as your test time increases, your precision will improve. That is, the, the precision goes gets to be a smaller, smaller and smaller margin of error improvement. So let's look at some example data. This is an assayed sample uh, here, and you can see I tested it at various test times, three seconds, five seconds, 10 seconds, all the way up to 120 seconds, okay? And this data set can, can show us a couple things. The first thing I want to draw your attention to is how little the reported value changed after the first few seconds. You can see here pretty quickly into the test, the instrument settled on about 2.7, 2.72 weight percent iron within a few seconds of starting the test. And this is in general that once an element is detected, longer test times have very little impact on accuracy. It's not that it has no impact, but the, the impact on accuracy is small once an element is detected. And you can see the change here is not much okay, in the reported value. But what does improve over time is our standard deviation or our margin of error or our percent error. These are, these are similar terms here uh, in the context of XRF statistics. And you can see that the standard deviation or the margin of error is decreasing in pretty significant jumps here in the first 20 or 30 seconds of, of the test. Longer test times in general will improve your margin of error, but it is a law of diminishing returns. So by the time we get out to 30 seconds, we see very little improvement the longer we test. In fact, going from 30 to 45, 50% longer, have almost no change. In fact, we could quadruple our test time from 30 seconds to 120 seconds and have functionally no improvement in our margin of error. So longer test times do improve our precision, but it's a law of diminishing returns. So how long you test is determined by what kind of precision requirements you need. And if we this is an absolute error, if we do this in terms of relative percent error, right, you can see we're settling in at about 0.3% relative error pretty quickly uh, in this test. And for most people, if you, iron is what you're looking at, percent level iron, you're going to be able to get away with a relatively short test, maybe even 10 or 20 second test time. Now, we could contrast that to something like gold, quantifying gold. Here's a sample with about 22 ppm gold. Same situation, increasing test times here. And here you'll notice that the relative percent error increases quite dramatically over the course of my 120 seconds. So I'm still detecting gold at 18 ppm within the first three seconds. Pretty good limits of detection, right? But my margin of error is six. This is 18 ppm plus or minus six ppm. That's a pretty wide window or 33% uh, margin of error at that short test time, right? And you, if you wanna get something under 10% relative error, some maybe even under 5% relative error, you're looking at the 30 to 45 second test time, right? This is different than the iron because now we're looking to measure something at extremely low concentrations versus something that's in the bulk percent level. So again, the principle of how long you test determines and by what kind of precision you need. If you're interested in trace PPM gold, you're probably gonna need longer test times to get high precision. If you're looking at the, the you know, grade control major elements, you're gonna have shorter test times based on the needs of your project. 
in general, we find from our, our clients that about 30 to 45 uh, seconds per beam is pretty common. I'm not giving this as uh, you know a law set in stone, but rather I share this as just sort of some general insights. What you would want to do as you start your XRF testing campaign is test some of your samples, representative samples, to determine where you are on this investment curve for a trade-off between test time and precision. Again, I'll invite you to put any questions you have in the uh, in the chat box as we move along. I'll be happy to answer those here uh, in the middle of the presentation or at the end, either one. Okay, so let's let's take one more example here. Uh, we've talked about precision, uh, and uh, but precision also relates to our limit of detection. Okay. In general, uh, the longer you test, the lower your limit of detection. And in fact, at short test times, you may not have reached the detection limit um, for a given element, um, depending on what the concentration is. Okay, so here's some here's some silver data. This is a, a, a sample with very low level uh, silver. I think the sample had 11 ppm silver in it, if I recall. You can see in the first 20, you know, 10 seconds here, the silver was not detected. That's what ND, non-detected here is. The longer we test, you see actually at 20 seconds, it reported a value, pretty low accuracy, because I think the sample had 11 ppm. Uh, and then actually, when I continued testing, it dropped back out uh, from being reported at all. Okay, and you may think, okay, well, the instrument's acting pretty squirrely, but what's going on here is that as we test longer, we're approaching uh, our limit of detection for, for silver. And as you bounce back and forth around, right around this range of the limit of detection, you'll see an element sort of toggle in and off, in and out of detection, okay? And you need to test long enough to get below that limit of detection to reliably detect. And you see there at 45, 60, 90 seconds, we've stabilized, we're consistently reporting it and, and sort of drilling in on an accurate value uh, here for the, for the silver. This is a very low level silver. Uh, and you can see our, 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 once we get below the limit of detection, our precision here, we were sort of in this flat range here where we're not getting much improvement as we test longer. But we need to test long enough to get below that limit of detection. So longer test times will improve your limit of detection. It too follows a law of diminishing returns. So how long you test will be determined by what kind of detection limits you need. If you're trying to get down to single digit gold or uh, see silver in the, you know, double digit silver, low trace silver, you may need to test longer. If you're looking again at the, at the major constituents, then you can test shorter amount of times. Okay? This is driven by your project requirements uh, um, in terms of the trade-offs that you need. So what it, you ask yourself as you set up uh, your XRF survey, what, what, what elements are, are critical for you as indicator elements for your project? Um, and that'll drive what kind of test times are required for, for you. Okay, I'll just take a second here. I've got a question, give me a second to read. Yeah, great. So um, the question uh, posed is how uh, relative error and absolute error, uh, the, this, this, these errors of absolute and relative uh, vary, is there a vary between um, uh, light elements and heavier elements? And that's a great question. So in general, the lighter the element, um, the lower our precision, okay? So precision or margin of error in XRF is directly proportional to how many x-rays we get back. So we always get back more x-rays for an element in high concentration and concentration for concentration, right? Two, two, um, let's say 1% magnesium versus 1% lead, okay? Even though the weight percents there are the same, we'll get way more x-rays back for the lead at 1% than we will the magnesium light element at 1%. Okay, so uh, you are correct that uh, our, the lighter the elements, the larger the standard deviation or the worse the precision there. That is a general trend. Heavier elements will have better precision, better margin of errors. Lighter elements will have worse precision, larger margin of errors. That's a general trend. Great question. Okay, so let's talk about sample containers. Um, and uh, the, the general principle here, right? So we've talked about homogeneity, consistency, 
um, uh, improvements with test time. When it comes to the containers, the primary principle to keep in mind is that nothing is transparent to x-rays. It may be transparent to visible light, something like glass is transparent to visible light, but nothing is transparent to x-rays. Okay, So I have here a quartz blank. Um, we include these with our kits. I'll talk more about these uh, later on. But uh, you know, this sort of is a good simulant for, for soil, right, which is major uh, mineral is typically quartz, right? And we're testing through various types of materials. And there's a couple things that's chart here. I'll step you through the, this data here on what, what, what to observe. First of all, you take something like a resealable bag, and by resealable bag, I mean something like a Ziploc bag, um, uh, you know, moderate thickness plastic here. Um, quartz should be about 50% silicon and about 50% light elements from the oxygen by weight. Okay, but when you test through this resealable bag, we're actually getting magnesium and aluminum and calcium reported, and that's because we've got magnesium and aluminum and calcium in the plastic itself. Take something like mylar, you have uh, some phosphorus in the mylar as well as other things. There can be calcium and iron, antimony and zinc from the catalysts in this mylar. I mentioned mylar in particular because if, if you've been doing XRF for more than a decade, in the early years of portable XRF, we couldn't measure light elements like magnesium or aluminum or silicon or phosphorus at all uh, with the pin detectors that we had. And so we used mylar as a film quite often because it, it didn't matter, we couldn't measure these instruments. And so I frequently come in contact with clients who have still have boxes of mylar sitting on, on their shelf. But mylar will obliterate your light element performance. In fact, you may not realize mylar uh, is actually an acronym for my, uh, must you lose all reliability. Okay? Using mylar here will obliterate your, your light element performance. Um, so if you have a box of mylar films in your in your lab or on your shelf or in your XRF case, go ahead and put that in the in the, in the trash can. You can see that testing through plastic can, can diminish your signal by as much as tenfold here through the plastic. Again, should be about 50%. We see about a 40% reduction from the mylar or a thin plastic bag, the thinnest plastic bag you can get at the grocery store or saran wrap or food wrap. We still see about uh, 30 to 40% reduction in, in signal. Uh, if you wanna play around with this, you can actually, don't, don't leave the webinar now, but you can scan this QR code, which will take you to the Center for X-ray Optics and you can put in various materials and simulate uh, the attenuation or the impact that that it'll have upon your X-ray signal. So in general, right, the plastics will decrease your light element performance and increase your LE reading, right, because the plastic is itself light elements. So whatever you put between the sample and the analyzer is going to impact your reading. Okay, lots of questions here, let me see. Let me just read through here. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna pause on a couple of these questions. I'm gonna pick them up at the end because I think we'll answer some of those as we go along. Okay, so not ignoring those questions. Great questions. We can do the same exercise with a soil sample. This is a NIST 2711A certified sample. This is a sedimentary, I think it's a Montana riverbed uh, soil sample here. And again, we could do this same exercise. You see that our light elements are significantly hampered, right? Decrease their readings here um, by testing through the plastic. Um, and in fact, something really light like magnesium, we absolutely torpedo the performance of that. Um, those elements from around 1% down to about a tenth of a percent as we test through those those plastics. Uh, except for this, this what looks like a fluke with a resealable bag, but remember this one actually had magnesium in it, so we're artificially inflating that reading. Okay. If we look at, if we go higher on the periodic table, a little heavier elements like calcium, titanium, iron, also you could include here like, you know, uh, chromium or vanadium or potassium, these moderately uh, uh, weight elements here. Here the impact of the plastic is is less. You can see iron 2.7 to about 2.5. The thicker the plastic, the more the decrease here. Uh, the thinner the plastic, the less the, the impact. But the impact is still real there. We still could be talking for anywhere from 10% uh, to 40% to, to impact. But by the time you get to your heavier elements like arsenic and lead, there's a, there's a minimal impact by testing through various types of containers. 
Okay, so if you're doing, let's say you're doing a remediation project where you're primarily concerned about lead or arsenic or some of the other heavier Rikra metals, then it may not matter if your test take your, you know, your trowel and your shovel, take some hand samples, put them in a Ziklop bag and test on the back of your tailgate. That may be fine enough. That may be fit for your purpose. But if you're trying to do total chemistry or you care about the light elements, then you can the impact will be greater. There's a great paper out there. Uh, again, if you scan this QR code, um, it'll take you to this publication in Geochemistry Exploration Environment Analysis by Dr. Michael Gasly and Katrin uh, Wellnitz, uh, which is, gives you a great uh, overview and detailed explanation of how X-ray transmission impacts portable XRF um, out in the field and, and goes into greater detail how it can make these informed decisions. And again, uh, the more plastic, or if you, again, if you're testing through a paper bag or something like that, a sample bag, you'd see this inflation of the LE reading. So if we look at the effect of plastic, or and using plastic bag as a proxy for sample containers in general, the percent error will be the greatest for the lighter elements, and that that percent error or the impact decreases the heavier element. This relates back to the data we saw for copper versus magnesium on you know, rock samples versus pulps versus pellets, and also relates back to the question posed earlier by one of the attendees about uh, precision, right? So the lighter the element, the weaker the x-rays, the more susceptible they are to sample prep and containment issues as we go through, the more the precision will suffer. Okay? Lighter the element, the greater the impact. Okay, so we talked about sample containers. Let's talk about sample prep now a little bit, okay? And how sample prep will impact your accuracy or your percent error, okay? And again, we think about this in terms of what your requirements are versus how much prep you want to do. So you wanna only spend time on sample prep where it matters for your project. If it doesn't matter, I mean, you could spend all day polishing your samples, right? But if, you're not, if it doesn't matter for your project, why, why invest that time? Okay. So a couple things to keep in mind, right, is that air is, is a light element and will impact your reading. Again, nothing is transparent to x-rays, not even air, right? Um, and as you have large grain sizes, you'll have gaps in there between the air, and this will cause a dilution in the values you get. It's going to contribute to the LE. And the same thing for water, right? Water, H2O, is going to contribute to your LE. But moisture is one of the hardest things to account for. In, in your readings because it can go different directions. Sometimes moisture can cause compaction, right? You imagine making a, a loaf of bread, you've got your sifted flour and your baking soda, and then you dump in your, your, your water or your buttermilk, right? And then all of a sudden it condenses into a sticky, sticky dough. It can increase sample density. But depending upon your mineralogy, moisture may actually cause swelling, particularly if you have a lot of clays in your, in your sample. Okay, and so sometimes moisture can increase density, some kind of decrease density, um, and uh, and either way, right, the LE is going to, the water is going to be contributing to that, that LE content. And uh, sometimes when you add the LE, then it displaces air, which is also, uh, when you add the water, it displaces the air, displaces one LE for another LE, so it can be very difficult to model moisture in your sample. And this is, again, a situation where consistency is important, uh, and in particularly if you're going to compare results, right? If you test in the field where the samples are damp, send them off to the lab where the first thing they do is dry them and then test them, you're changing the mass composition there by removing the water. You need to keep that in mind uh, as you do your analysis. Okay, so let's look at the effect of compaction here. Okay, going from sort of a loose dry powder here uh, to various le levels of compaction, increasing compaction, up to even compressing it into a soil cup. I could have done a pressed pellet here as well. Uh, you would have saw this the same trend here. Okay, now it isn't that the instrument is reporting inaccurately, right? You see different value here, but rather the density is changing as you compact. XRF is giving you a weight percent or a mass fraction. So if you change the density, the mass fraction is going to, to change, okay? 
So the biggest thing we see, right, is that as we displace air, the LE, the light element reading, is going down because we're displacing air from the sample. When we look at the lighter elements, which are attenuated or absorbed by these air, in general, we're going to see the lighter elements increasing their mass fraction as you displace the low mass air. But when we look at the heavy elements, right, when there's lots of air, the iron there is a large weight percent uh, of the overall sample that has air in it versus when we displace the air uh, and compact it, the mass fraction goes down when we compact these samples. Okay, And this is what we should expect from a, from a mass density calculation standpoint. Again, the most important principle here is consistency. Uh, and particularly if you're going to compare results across your project. Okay. Now, when if you purchase an instrument from, from Olympus, from Evidence Scientific, we include two samples with them. I showed pictures of these earlier in our data set. Okay. These are check samples. These are not calibration samples. I'll talk about calibration in a minute. But rather, we would refer to these as check samples. These QR codes here will take you to the certificates for these two blanks. One's a sedimentary soil sample, and one's a quartz, quartz blank. Okay. The question is, what are these check samples for? And again, they're not for calibration. I'll get to that in just a minute. But these two samples serve a different purpose. The quartz is primarily... Uh, the primary purpose of the quartz blank is to check for false positives, to make sure the instrument on your window is clean and that when you should only be reporting silicon and light elements in a quartz blank, that is in fact the only thing the instrument is reporting. And the EPA method 6200 calls out using a quartz blank for exactly this, this purpose. The NIST soil sample is a nice multi-element uh, reference sample. And the primary purpose here, again, is not for calibration, but rather for monitoring consistency. Is the instrument reading the same today as it was yesterday, as it is this afternoon, as it is tomorrow, as it is next week, as it is next year? Okay, monitoring consistency over time, not so much accuracy. And we have a great tutorial about this. Again, if you scan this QR code or if you just go and Google geochemical technical tutorial series from Olympus, we have a great multi-part series and, and part eight, uh, nice six minute video here, talks about how to set up a QA, QC program uh, for portable XRF. <clears throat> Okay, we had a great couple questions here about um, about attenuation. Uh, let me just go back to that while we're here. Um, uh, uh, go back here for the questions. Apologies, I didn't catch this question earlier. Okay, uh, one question was about proline. Okay, proline is as transparent to X-rays as possible. Okay, so that it's it has the least amount of attenuation. Uh, it's more attenuation than none. Uh, but uh, is the least attenuation possible of any of the XRF films. And in fact, when we calibrate our instruments for geochem, we assume the presence of one proline film there. And so the proline attenuation uh, is small. Someone else asked about paper sacks, and those are very common in the mining industry when you send your pulps off to the lab. Okay, the attenuation from the paper bag is going to be even greater than it, uh, it, um, than the plastic or food wrap. And in fact, if you go to this um, reference here from, from Dr. Gasly. He talks about paper sacks explicitly in the attenuation, but it's gonna be along the, the range of a, of a plastic bag or a food wrap a little bit greater. So pretty significant attenuation for a paper sack um, uh, um, for your light elements, less so for your, for your heavy elements. Proline is, is your best option uh, possible. Another question here was asking about what makes the light elements um, fluoresce weaker. And uh, the, the main answer here is that the, the X-rays uh, are low energy. So the lighter the element, the lower the energy of the X-rays. So this is why XRF can't measure oxygen or why XRF can't measure carbon, uh, because the, the X-rays from carbon or oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen are so weak, they're so low energy, um, that air itself absorbs the X-rays from, from oxygen or from sodium um, there. And so 
uh, a heavy element has high energy x-rays, something like lead or arsenic. Uh, and as we get higher on the periodic table, we get to lower and lower or weaker, lower energy or weaker x-rays, uh, which get attenuated or, or absorbed by everything around them. So really, really good questions. Yeah, so somebody mentioned about their st uh, standards coming in those paper sacks, and that's a common way for them to uh, to be shipped. Uh, we we purchase a lot of instruments, for, or excuse me, some certified reference samples from Arrayus, and they come in like a foil bag. Uh, and I would recommend you take your standards out of those bags uh, and repack them in soil cups. And I'll talk about soil cups in a, in a few minutes. Okay, so let's jump forward. I know there's a couple more questions. I'll I'll pick those up as we go along. Appreciate the engagement from everyone. Okay, so again, these check these samples are primarily what we consider check samples, not calibration samples. I see that someone asked a question about uh, what they should do to calibrate their sample to best align with lab results. Okay, so let's talk about calibration a little bit. Um, so first of all, I would want to encourage you to avoid what I call the single point calibration check fallacy. Okay, single point calibration check. So let's imagine you have a reference sample. Uh, this reference sample has an assay of 4.5% iron, and you shoot it with your XRF instrument and it reports 4.39, almost 4.4%. Okay, this is 2.5% relative error. So pretty good, you right? I'd take a 97.5% grade on any exam I ever had to take. Okay, so pretty good performance. If you took this one element, and this one sample, you might say, okay, hey, my XRF instrument's pretty good, okay? If in that same sample, though, you took instead arsenic, assay of 396 ppm, almost 400 ppm, the, your XRF reports 233, okay, almost half, right? 200 versus 400. This is 41% relevant there. At this point, you might want to pull your hair out and, you know, uh, curl up in the fetal position and cry, and you think your analyzer is really, really bad, okay? But what I want to encourage you here is to avoid the, the concept of single point calibration checks. And sometimes I see in the literature people do this idea of um, uh, percent retention uh, or, or reclaim percentages, okay? The risk here is of really skewing your perspective on the instrument's performance by singling in on a single element or a single reading or even a single standard. So here's that same instrument's performance on arsenic over a large calibration range from single digit arsenic all the way up to 500 ppm arsenic, multiple samples, multiple reference samples. Okay, and you can see over a large uh, concentration range on diverse samples, different sample compositions, not just of arsenic, but of the other elements, you can see a, a nice linear, high precision, high accuracy performance on arsenic across a large concentration range. And I would argue that this indicates that the instrument has a very robust calibration for arsenic. And I've circled here in red, right, that single data point. And if you focused in on this single data point out of the, the 20 or so data points are here, you might conclude that the instrument is really erroneous, or if you adjust the calibration to this single data point, you would actually be making the calibration worse overall rather than better. Okay, so avoid the single point calibration check fallacy. But rather, in an ideal situation, what you want to do is take multiple samples, the very least multiple samples, and ideally have them be matrix matched. So uh, samples that match your deposit type. If you're working in sedimentary soils, get some sedimentary soils. If you're working in copper porphyries, get some copper porphyry. porphyry or free reference samples, or if you're nickel, doing nickel natter, laterites, get some nickel laterite reference samples. Or you're doing lead zinc sulfide, you know, whatever your samples are. They can even be your samples yourself that you've had assayed by the, la the lab. By, by taking four to six reference samples, low, medium low, medium, medium high, high concentration ranges, multiple samples from multiple elements, you can develop that, that uh, uh, calibration curve, and you can build this into your quality control program. Again, there's a great uh, publication here, Workflow for Exploration Sampling. This is not from Olympus. This is by uh, other uh, researchers independent of uh, Olympus that talk to you about how to build up your QC methodology of having multiple reference samples that you monitor over time um, as a part of your initial 
quality assurance and then part of your quality control program throughout the process of your of your project okay so i'd highly recommend this reference to you and we can talk about setting up a qc program more uh, in our q a session okay so a couple key takeaways and then we'll we'll transition to to, to questions again consistency and homogeneity is the key Okay, you wanna be as consistent in your testing protocol and your sample prep procedures so that you're doing apples to apples. Keep in mind that nothing is transparent to, to x-rays, okay? Um, not even air, okay? Proline's as transparent as possible, but even it's not completely transparent. Um, sample containment effects will have an impact and you can decide whether those are relevant for, for you, how much they impact your reading. Um, and again, whenever possible, if you want to go to the sort of gold standard, then soil cups are really your, your friend here. Okay, we have a nice, um, if you scan this QR code, it'll also be in the playback. Um, there we have some guides to sample preps, how to make sample cups, where you can get sample cups, uh, sample prep equipment there um, to, to guide you further. And I'd be happy to take questions about, more questions about sample prep in the Q&A. Regarding soil cups and particular and commercial resources for this. If you scan this QR code, it will take you to a link for where to get pellet presses, where to get mills, where to get soil cups. These are not things Olympus sells. So uh, we have no commercial incentive to send you here. We don't get any kickbacks uh, or commission from the, the resources here. These are just things that we provide to our clients as a resource of where you can get uh, commercial sources for, for sample prep uh, equipment. So again, where you fall on this uh, investment curve, how much effort, how much time, how much cost, the, the required investment, depends on what standard you're trying to meet for your project and your needs. Maybe it's low, maybe it's high, but hopefully some of these considerations about sample prep, accuracy, um, can help you decide uh, what's right for you and what's right for your project. Invest the time in sample prep and, and testing where it matters for your project. Don't, don't throw your money or time away where you don't get your return on your investment. Okay, so thank you. We've gotten lots of questions along the way. Let me start working through here and continue to add your, your questions as, as we go along. Let me make sure I've, uh, I've answered these here. Okay, somebody asked about how this performance changes with the types of samples, soil, sediments, plant, water, okay? This is a great question, okay? Our calibration in general does really well for uh, across a large range of sample types from uh, heavily mineralized samples like iron ore or lead zinc uh, sulfide, things that are heavily mineralized uh, to things that are relatively low mineralization like many soils which have a high quartz content. Uh, you could use this uh, in sediments uh, and even really low density things like liquids or oils, um, um, uh, you know, hydrogeochemistry, uh, you can use these there. Now, in general, as you move to different sample types from something heavily mineralized, to something like soil to something very low density like water, you will often have to do some calibration adjustment. You should see a pretty linear, precise performance across those various sample types. Um, but, uh, um, but to really dial in your accuracy, don't be surprised if you need to get some matrix match samples to, to do that there. Okay, somebody mentioned that they've uh, had one of our instruments with several different calibration types. Okay, and the question is, of course, which one is right for you? Um, this is something I would encourage you to reach out to your, your evident representative. Um, you can reach out to, to my team. Uh, you can reach us at uh, analytical instruments at ani.group at olympus.com. You can reach out to us with any questions you have, whether you have an instrument or not, we'll be happy to try to support you. And so the question of which calibration is best for you depends, of course, on what project that you have. But in general, our Geochem calibration, uh, what we call commercially either Geochem 2 or Geochem 3, is generally the best calibration uh, for uh, really any geological type material, whether it's soils, sediments, hard rock, minerals, you know, uh, heavily, you know, 
mineralized ores. In general, Geochem 2 or Geochem 3 is going to be the best calibration for you. But it's best to talk about this in the specific context of your project. So feel free to reach out to us at ani.group uh, at olympus.com for, for more details about your specific need. Okay, great. I got a question here about uh, different types of iron. Uh, iron 2 plus oxidation state versus iron 3 plus oxidation state. Uh, or if you're th in, used to thinking this in terms of minerals like uh, magnetite versus hematite versus gothite, right? Those are different um, mineral types of iron and different oxidation states of iron. One of the things about XRF to keep in mind is that uh, it provides total chemistry. So it will give you the total iron content, not uh, the uh, mineral content or the individual oxidation state. So we can't distinguish the type of iron that's present in hematite from the type of iron that's present in magnetite or gothite. We'll just give you a total iron reading uh, for your sample there. A couple questions here about, about proline. Again, proline is the best option if you are going to, to, to do sample cups. Um, then I would recommend that the films you use for these sample cups be proline. Uh, they're typically four microns. That's as thin as you can get and as transparent as you can get. There's still some attenuation. Um, in our calibration, we expect that there will be at least one proline film, sort of expect you having a sample cup, um, but you want to, to you know, minimize the attenuation as much as possible uh, and, and proline. You can have a, the proline, um, attenuation or how much it impacts varies based on on the element. So for something like magnesium, it can have about a 10% relative attenuation, whereas something for like iron or lead, uh, we're probably talking about a tenth of a percent attenuation. So it varies based on element, but proline's the best you can get for for film material. If you do want to set up your XRF program to to uh, you know correlate with your lab results as best as possible. Again, I would strongly recommend this reference to you here about uh, QC methodology, but you want to get matrix match samples, again, four to six reference samples or, or your own samples that you've had assayed that you can use to verify the calibration. The Vanta will do very well out of box. Our out of box calibration is quite robust, uh, but if you really want to dial in that accuracy, matrix match samples is, is the best option for you there. Somebody asked about where to get uh, reference samples. Um, there are several uh, resources for getting certified reference samples, depending on where you are in the globe. Um, so usually, you know, uh, in the U.S., the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, is a very good reference place to get reference samples. Uh, I also highly recommend the Aureus samples, O-R-E-A-S, Aureus. Um, and you can get these in North America. You can get these globally, really. Um, uh, Australia, Canada, the US, uh, Latin America, Aureus um, makes good standards. Canada has their own uh, uh, national set of reference samples you can get. Uh, and there's, there's ones in uh, Canada um, as well. If you go to this QR code here, this guide for sample prep, we have a... Um, uh, we have a link to where you can get certified reference samples. And that reminds me, it's a good point to uh, mention in the engagement section there, we have several handouts that you can download. And one of those handouts is uh, the sample prep solutions and where you can get certified reference samples. We'll send this in the follow-up uh, as well, uh, all of these resources, but uh, NIST, Aureus, um, uh, in our can uh, in Canada, there's several uh, uh, resources for getting those certified references and we'll send you links again these are not things that evidence sells so we have no commercial interest in these companies i'm just telling you they're high quality resources available if you have your own samples then of course there are industrial testing labs uh, that will analyze your samples um, there are several good you know uh, industrial uh, analytical labs in the marketplace um, Many of them focused on with geochem focused and mining focused resources. Somebody asked about what I mean by multiple uh, samples for this. Um, again, uh, I would recommend at least four to six samples uh, if at all possible. 
and you want four to six samples that span a concentration range. So you don't want four to six samples that are functionally the same composition, but rather you want four to six samples that span from high to low, from low, medium, low, medium, medium, high, high. If your iron is going to range from you know, five to 25%, then you want samples that have five, 10, 15, 20, and 25% iron in that range. If your arsenic is going to be from, from 10 to 50 ppm, again, you want samples that span arsenic from the low to the high range. If you choose five, you could have 10 samples, you could have 100 samples, but if they all have functionally the same composition, uh, if the concentration range is very narrow, then that won't help you uh, um, build your, your, your reference calibration curve. But four to six samples that span your range is usually a pretty good, um, pretty good uh, practice. Okay, somebody asked about percent error uh, when taking multiple samples. Um, so in general, again, this is gonna depend upon the element. The lighter the element, the larger the standard deviation. Uh, but typically we would look for plus or minus 10 relative percent as a standard deviation. So if something was uh, 100 ppm was the true value, that would be between 90 and 110 ppm. Um, if something was 5% uh, iron, that would be between 4.5 and 5.5% iron, right? In general, 10 relative percent uh, standard deviation uh, or better on your, on your samples. Really great questions. Thank you to everyone who's contributing. Okay, I got a couple questions here about, about grinding and homogenizing. This is a, this is a, a difficult question. Um, Again, I would point you to um, uh, this resource here about commercial sources for sample prep. And I talk about several different options for, um, for grinding your sample. In fact, um, uh, it really depends on your sample. If you have a soil sample, uh, which is pretty fine grain and pretty friable, uh, you can actually often get away with uh, grinding your soil sample with something like a coffee grinder. Um, and so I think I actually have a picture of this if I go through here, jump ahead here. Right, this is a cheap, cheap uh, Krups coffee grinder in the U.S. These cost about 15 bucks. You'll wear them out over time, but at 15 dollars, you can uh, you can afford to burn through them. This works well for something uh, that's relatively friable or have a low more hardness, like soils. Pretty easy to homogenize. But if you have something that's a hard rock mineral, um, then you're gonna wanna get some kind of mill. And there are uh, several options. Again, if you scan this QR code, it'll take you to them. Uh, you can use something like a masonry drill or a rotary drill, it's like you might drill rock or drill brick with to get some powdered samples. Those work pretty well. There are portable mills, portable grinders, uh, even battery operated ones that you can get. And then of course you can get large laboratory bench top ones. But in the field, you probably want something that's battery operated, um, uh, sort of low tech if you're gonna try to do this in the, in the field. Um, uh, and then, of course, the harder the rock, uh, the, the, the more professional grade grinder that you need to, to homogenize that sample. So it's, uh, it, again, depends on your type of project um, there. Uh, but it, but we, I give various options from sort of cheap to, uh, to, to extremely expensive at this, this, at this guide right here. Okay, somebody asked about uh, a link to the NIST standards. I will go back to that. Give me one second here. Okay, uh, again, with uh, evident instruments, uh, if you get a Vanta, we include two check samples. One is this quartz blank, uh, and one is this NIST uh, sedimentary soil sample. Again, there's nothing magical about this, this soil sample other than it's just a nice multi-element soil sample. And if you scan either of these QR codes, it will take you to the certificate for that, for the NIST sample or the quartz sample. Um, and or, or again, you can always uh, email us at ani.group and we're happy to send a copy of that to you. Somebody asked about uh, how, how to, to, to get your own samples assayed or verified. Um, uh, again, uh, if you're wanting to do this independently, you can send it off to commercial labs. The question about what technique to use, whether you should use ICP, inductively coupled plasma, uh, this, this is a question to be attentive to. There are several techniques 
uh, in the marketplace for acid digestion, uh, peroxy, uh, and you know uh, the fusion methods. Okay, and those, uh, which one is best for your sample type depends. Not everything dissolves in four acid. Not everything dissolves in the peroxy or the fusion. So uh, you really need to approach that question carefully. Uh, based upon what's your sample type. And again, I would encourage, uh, you know, I can't answer specifically for your project. So if you want to discuss what's right for your project, uh, I would encourage you to reach out to us at ani.group uh, at olympus.com. And I'd be happy to set up a meeting to address in specifics for your project, what might be the best laboratory technique for your sample types. Um, one recommendation I can give to everyone is that when you send off samples, um, not all labs are created equal, and so you want to do QC on your own lab. And so I would get some certified reference samples from somebody like NIST or Arrhaeus and include them with them, only do so blindly. Don't tell the lab that it's NIST 2711A. Don't tell the lab that it's Arrhaeus 901 or Arrhaeus uh, you know, 131, okay? But just put it in as if it's one of your samples uh, and see how well they do on the certified samples as well as yours to do your own blind quality assurance with the lab that you that you use. Great, somebody asked a question about uh, sample, uh, how, to, how to make sample cups. Um, that's a great question. I'll talk through this in, in, in general terms. I don't have any sample uh, cups with me. Uh, but again, if you go to this link here, I actually have a set of videos about how to, to make uh, sample cups. There's there's a couple components. There's a cup itself, the main body. There's a snap ring here with some serrations on it. And then there's the clear film. And what I, what I recommend you do is you put the, uh, the ring serration up down on, the, on your tabletop, lay the proline film over top of it, kind of drape it like a veil over the top, and then press the cup into the film down on the tabletop using the palm of your hand. And I have a series of videos at this QR if you go to the website for this QR code that shows you step by step what you need to make a sample cup, including ways to press it, best ways to press it, uh, how you can use sample cups for liquids, how to assemble and pack those and do those labels. Um, so I recommend you go to this resource. Again, we'll include this link in the follow-up email uh, for everyone. Okay, somebody asked a question about the effect of density and changing the density if you grind the sample. Uh, and this is this is something to uh, um, to be aware of. In general, if you if you've got a high density uh, mineral, um, this this can this can be difficult. Any high density minerals tend to attenuate X-rays a lot. Um, but if you are going to pulverize it, then I would recommend pressing that into a pellet. At the very least, press it into a soil cup. Uh, but ideally press it into a pellet uh, to get as close to the uh, natural mineral density as, as possible um, uh, when, you, when you press those pellets. Okay, great. Again, very good questions, very good engagement. I wanna thank everyone for uh, joining us today. Uh, again, if you, at any time, you can reach out to us at ani.group at olympus.com. I'm Michael Hall, one of the X-ray specialists and uh, you'll get an answer from me and our team when you email us that. We're, we love to support our customers, even if you don't have one of our instruments, but you're interested in getting started on uh, portable x-ray fluorescence, we'll be happy to support you. So thank you again for, for joining Evident on our Inspection 360 webinar, and we hope you'll join us again in the future.